memories of the golden days of radio recalled by Margaret Christensen. Hello, this is Margaret Christensen. I've been asked to share with you some of my memories covering the rise of radio drama in Australia. These memories will include the radio serials or soap operas, soapies we used to call them, which were so popular here a few years ago. Dad and Dave, Courtship and Marriage, Dr. Paul, Portia Faces Life, Fred and Maggie Everybody, Life with Dexter, Josephine Empress of Sorrows, to name but a few. Oh, and it just wouldn't be right to neglect talking about the landmarks of the Australian radio industry, such as the Lux Radio Theatre, the Caltex Theatre. They were the big one-hour Sunday night dramas the whole nation waited for all week. And other important landmarks in radio entertainment, the great Colgate Palmer Olive shows, the Cash Bouquet show, Palm Olive Hour, the Protex Quiz show, Strike It Rich, and Lorne Lasting Loveliness, all with their great stars and personalities such as Roy Reen, Moe, that superb New Zealand quiz master Jack Davy, Ada and Elsie, Will Fennell, why one could just go on and on. You know, I can remember as a girl at school rushing through my homework and the washing up to settle down in the lounge room with my mother and the dog to listen avidly to the old George Edwards players in adaptations of famous novels such as The Hunchback of Notre Dame and thrillers such as Inspector Scott of Scotland Yard. Little did I realise then that I would one day be part of the George Edwards players and also be involved so deeply with the immense radio industry which blossomed during and after the war. From the mid-thirties to the mid-fifties, radio played a major role in Australia and New Zealand's entertainment, and these pioneer serials were recorded at EMI Homebush, Sydney, by this small group of actors headed by George Edwards and his wife, Nell Sterling. These shows were Dad and Dave, Martin's Corner, Inspector Scott, or many others, and the actors had to be versatile as they were expected to play several parts, changing their voices so that they wouldn't be recognised. They also did the sound effects, such as footsteps made by walking in a box of gravel, like this. And the sound of fire made by crushing cellophane in the hands, thus. And all in all were general factotums around the studio. Nell Sterling, who was the original Mabel in Dad and Dave, appeared in all George Edwards' productions and was very famous for her piercing scream, which was usually the cliffhanger which left listeners on the edge of their chairs until the following night. Now, in these shows, the early radio dramas, seldom, if ever, were the public allowed to know the names of the actors playing the parts. Credits were virtually unknown, and I think the main reason for this was the fact that moments on commercial radio were precious and worth money in advertising, and credits, well... They just took up too much time. So maybe you'd be interested to know that George Edwards was dad, Loris Bingham was mum, Lorna Bingham, her daughter, wrote the show and played Annie, John Saul was the original Dave, and Eric Scott played Snake Gully's narc-in-chief, Bill Smith. Let's hear a bit, shall we? Bill, Bill, you don't mean that. I do mean it, Dad. As far as you and I are concerned, we're through. Come on, Eddie, we're going home. I'm only too anxious to go home, Bill. Father, don't go away like that. I feel sure you'll regret it. Taking sides as usual, Mabel. Good night, all. Come on, Eddie. Oh, say that's oh, awful. Gosh, I don't think I've ever seen Mr. Smith so angry. To think that he wouldn't take my hand after all these years, just because of a few hasty words at a council meeting. Oh, don't worry about it, Dad. He'll come round by the morning. Yes, of course he will. You know what Bill's like, Dad. He does his block before he knows where he is, and then the next time you meet him, he's sorry. Yes, I suppose that's the way of it, Dave, but I must admit to... Uh, it was a bit of a shock to me. Yes, he's certainly on his high horse tonight, Dad. Well, I don't see why he should have been. I didn't mean any offence. Oh, no, we all knew that except Bill, Dad. Oh, well, he'll be over his bad temper by tomorrow. In a way, you know, you can understand it, Dad. He loves being mayor. Well, as far as I'm concerned, I couldn't stand Mr. Smith as mayor much longer. I don't mean to hurt your feelings, Mabel, and I think he's very good on council business, but, oh, dear, the way he's been going on. Yes, we know, Annie, but he meant well. Oh, yes, I know that, but it's very trying. Oh, well, I suppose we'd 
Better get home. Mum will be waiting for me. Oh, I suppose we'd all better get home. And don't worry, Dad. It's only one of my father's little tantrums. And if he should be still feeling a little bit annoyed tomorrow, Dave and I'll know how to handle him. We're going over to my mother and father's place then. So while we're there, I'll make it my business to soothe everything over. Good night, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> Remember how the music always speeds up at the end? That meant for me and thousands of children time for bed. Many years later, when Nell passed on, I was asked to take over the part of Mabel, which I did. And it's hard to say how many listeners noticed the difference. I like to feel that listeners were not too disappointed in the changeover. Max Osberston, by this time, had replaced John Saul as Dave, and there were other changes also in the cast. But it never lost its popularity. Good old Dad and Dave. The pioneer days were the bad old days in some ways because actors and musicians were still regarded as rogues and vagabonds and were happy to practically give away their services to work in their chosen professions. To record eight episodes a morning for about a guinea with a cup of tea and bickies thrown in was considered a fair enough thing. This, of course, was way before the days of Actors' Equity and the Musicians' Union. But the pioneer days, with all their colour and vitality, were completely necessary to teach actors the business of working quickly. They would go into a studio, pick up eight scripts, flip through and mark them, then fly them, which means to record without a read-through or rehearsal. One morning a week was reserved for each show, and the Sydney radio actor became quite adept at sight reading and the instant interpretation of a character. And in those days, all the shows were recorded on acetate disc, which meant that mistakes or fluffs had to either be eliminated or covered skillfully or go right back to the top and start again. Now, as the actors were usually keen to get away on time to another recording job, the one who fluffed and held them up was never very popular. I wonder how many of you used to listen to Hagen Circus? This was an early serial, but not strictly a soapy, as it was given a prime spot in nighttime listening. I have an idea it went on the air about 7.15pm, four nights a week. Naturally, any show on this time slot has a ready-made audience, as in Australia, and I guess New Zealand, where families like to dine early together with the children, supper and the washing up would be over, the children in pyjamas ready to hit the hay, and mum and dad settling in for a good evening's listening. Hagen Circus was made at radio station 2UE and was produced by brilliant Paul Jacklin, now the great white chief at J. Walter Thompson Advertising Agency, Sydney office. Max Afford wrote the show, Thelma Scott and New Zealander Guy Dolman as Grant Andrews played the two leads, and in the next insert you'll hear me as a very young actress playing the naughty, willful Winnie. Let's whoop it up and listen to some. Hagen Circus! The show of shows! You haven't seen Fancy Pants about, have you? Fancy Pants? Yeah. Grand Andrews, that beautiful trapeze artist. Oh, um, you know him? <laughs> Not as well as I'd like to. I, I see. Hey, darling, your face has gone funny all of a sudden. <laughs> has it? I, I don't see any reason why it should. Oh, oh. Don't. Before we leave the early days, I'd like to tell you another married couple who were sturdy pioneers of radio drama in Australia, Edward Howell and Therese Desmond, or Ted and Molly, as they were affectionately known in the business. These two extremely talented folk produced many fine shows under the auspices of AWA, such as Coronets of England, Pride and Prejudice, in which I played Jane, my very first role in a radio serial in Sydney. But perhaps the Howells were better known to you all as Fred and Maggie, everybody. Let's take our minds back with a snip from the show. Fred and Maggie, everybody. Oh, Maggie, I'm home, dear. Who's this, I thought it was you when you called out Ufu. Here, that's right, dear. Got a little surprise for you, too, Maggie. Oh, goodness, Fred, you are sweet. Whatever is it? Yeah, dear. <laughs> little purple boy. <laughs> can I open it now, sir? Ah, yes, can if you like, dear. Oh, goodness, you are awful, Fred. You shouldn't waste money on things for me, dear. Oh, I wonder what it is. 
Oh. Pick. You are a meanie. It's only a packet of calcimine. That's right, Maggie. Calcimine. Heavens, it's a long time since I heard that, and many memories, fond ones, it revives. Molly Howell, long since passed on, was a brilliant and very beautiful lady with marvellous red-gold hair and a fascinating personality. Her wacky character of Maggie was superbly written for her by Ted, and I have specially affectionate memories of this show because Ted, who seemed to think I had some talent, wrote a part for me which ran for some time, the part of a dear funny old duck called Mrs. Kofizlovich, who spoke with a very thick accent like this. Well, I guess that's about the size of it for the moment. It's an ill wind that blows nobody any good, and the war years meant that no shows could be imported from the USA. However, many scripts of the soap operas seemed to reach us from there, and recording companies would engage an Australian writer to adapt them for the local market, such as changing dollars into pounds, and talking about a hot summer Christmas instead of a cold winter one. These soapies caused a real boom in the local industry. They included the slow-moving serials such as When a Girl Marries, recorded at AWA. Slow-moving? There is a legend, supposedly true, that Ray Hartley, playing a little boy in this show, was sent up to bed in one episode and didn't come down again for two years. The narrator always played an important part in the soapies, both to introduce the shows and to remind the listeners what had gone before. Frank Waters, the narrator of When a Girl Marries, used to open each episode by crooning into the microphone... When a girl marries, for all those who are in love, and all those who can remember. Big Sister was another really slow mover, made by Macquarie, and was always introduced with the legend, Big Sister, the story of an understanding woman. My daughter Wendy coined a beautiful paraphrase on this, as she felt that Big Sister was an incredibly dreary lady, enjoying her woes and sufferings like the true martyr that she was. Wendy, of course, was only 15 at the time, so she didn't believe that anyone could be so cloying, and used to say, Big Blister, the story of an understanding plum pudding. We actors playing in it took up the catch cry to break the monotony. I played the other woman, but am not in the following segment. So let's listen to Big Sister doing her suffering act. Ruth, I've been thinking... Yes, Neddy? Summer holidays will be here soon. No more school for Richard, less work for you. So, I thought... What are you trying to tell me, Ned? You can get away from Glen Falls for a while. But why should I want to do that? This is my home, my life. Yes, you're everybody's friend in this town. Anybody wants advice or help, they come to my sister. Everybody except John. What about John? He's your husband, Ruth. It isn't right for him to be away in the city for so long. Neddy, John's gone away to sort himself out. I don't mind. I think it's just as well there was another woman, don't you? During the golden days, Station 2 UW used to broadcast serials almost 24 hours a day, starting at 9 a.m., going all through the day and most of the night, so you can imagine the bulk of radio serials in production. Children, too, were well catered for, because the George Edwards players made the golden boomerang for years, and then, just after the war finished, Macquarie decided to call to the teenage and juvenile market with Superman on the network. Len Teal was Superman, and I played Lois Lane, the girl reporter. Our narrator was yet another New Zealander, Frank Bennett. Listen. Superman! Lois, don't you notice the sky getting lighter? What? Why, yes. It's, it's like day arriving all of a sudden. Oh, it can't be. It's only ten o'clock. Gosh, Lois, look, all those flaming colors. Oh, what in the world is it? Listen to the roar. Well, it's hard to tell exactly. Whatever it is, it's coming fast. Oh, I'm nervous, Clark. There's something strange about that thing. No, no, no. Hold on to yourself. There's nothing to be afraid of. I wonder. I, I think that thing's coming straight for us. All right, George, you're right. I know what it is now. It's a meteor. That's what it is. And it is coming straight for us. It's going to hit the car.
period, Macquarie was a second home to me, as I was sometimes recording all day, several days a week there. Lovely shows, such as Tree Grows in Brooklyn, My Son, My Son, Serialized for Library of the Air, and the old Ingrid Bergman film Saratoga Trunk, in which I played the Bergman role, was very popular with listeners and played to full lounge rooms all over the country. I'd love to be able to play segments of all these shows to you, but you understand that in order to bring you this program, we've had to dive into the archives, and whilst many of the old shows were kept here in New Zealand, many were sent back to the producers in Australia. So, until next time, Margaret Christensen saying au revoir. Memories of the golden days of radio, recalled by Margaret Christensen. Hello, this is Margaret Christensen. Let's talk again about more of the most popular soapies, the longer running ones such as Dr. Paul and Portia Faces Life. These seldom retained the same casts throughout the years. I really couldn't say offhand how long Dr. Paul did run, but Diana Shearing was the original Virginia, and John Saul the original Dr. Paul. That amazing Texan tycoon Grace Gibson produced both these shows. They both hit the jackpot, and more Grace Gibson runaway successes collected the ratings. They were given prime listening times during the morning, four days a week, and hundreds of thousands of housewives all over Australia and New Zealand wept and laughed with Virginia and Portia, two other suffering heroines. When Dinah wanted to go into a stage play, which was to tour, I was requested to take over the part in Dr. Paul, which I did, and I played it for some years. Let's hear some. Hello, darling. Oh, Paul, it's you. Uh, what are you doing stuck in this room on such a beautiful morning? I expected to find you out in the garden. I wanted to stay in here, Paul. Mm. How are you, darling? I'm all right. Now, I've got a bundle of things for you. Uh, I'll just put them over here. Uh, there are books and uh, some cakes Molly made. Oh, and here's a present from Junior. From Junior? Uh, just a minute. Here. It's a drawing he did of a train. He's mad about trains, you know, and he did this drawing specially for you. you know. Of course, you've got to use your imagination to see that it's a train, but at this... Well, here, but... Virginia, aren't you going to take it to look at it? Uh, leave it on the table, Paul. Darling, Junior sent it to you. It's your son. I said leave it over there on the table. Yes, very well. Yes, I'll, I'll put it here with your books. Well, what sort of a week have you had? Oh, much the same as usual. Um, well, tell me what you did and what you learned. Oh, by the way, Molly sends you her love, and Carlotta wants to know when she can come over and see you. Now, so many people want to come and see you, Virginia. I don't want them, Paul. I, I don't want people coming over here to look at me and feel sorry for me. Portia Faces Life, the other Grace Gibson Bolter, starred that really great radio actress, Lyndall Barber. Portia is still facing life in Sydney, as it's still being made each week there, though whether or not with the original cast, I couldn't say. Maybe if we listen to a little, I can identify the voices for you. May I come in? Oh, it's you. Yes, please do. I thought you'd gone back to Harrisville. My plane leaves at four. And you came to say goodbye. How very touching. Say goodbye and to ask a favor. Favor? Of me? I don't know what Christopher's plans are. I presume he'll stay on in Claymore for a while. No doubt you'll be seeing quite a bit of him. No doubt. I saw Bishop Goodman this morning. He's granted him a leave of absence from the church. Very generous of him. But he needn't have bothered. Christopher's decided to resign anyway. Oh, I know he's agreed to reconsider his decision. But that means nothing. He's made up his mind. The favor I came to ask is this. He may listen to you, he may not. But if you were to ask him not to resign, at least till you get your freedom, till your divorce comes through... Now, why would I do a thing like that? Surely it won't make much difference to you. Mm, not to me, but it might to him. Can't you understand? He wants to resign. I didn't talk him into it. It was his own idea. Yes, well, now, in that two-handed scene, I didn't recognize one of them, but the other one was definitely Lindell Barber. 
Now, by the middle of the war years, the radio drama industry was booming. Shows like Aunt Jenny's Real Life Story, starring Ethel Lang, and Mary Livingston, M.D., with New Zealander Hildesker, were wonderful sources of work for actors, and we all did many of them. All the important networks, such as Macquarie and Major Networks, AWA, Station 2UE, ARC, BAP, John Appleton Productions, and many more too numerous to mention, all rushed into full-time production. If an actor was not racing round Sydney all day and half the night from job to job recording shows and doing the hour-long dramas on the weekend, he was considered to be out of work. Even Auntie ABC hopped on the soapy bandwagon and came up with the Lawsons in which I played Ruth. And this show eventually became the famous marathon Blue Hills in which I played Emmy for some time and which is still running, now into its more than 5,000th episode. Even today, suburban and country life in Australia grinds to a halt at 1pm to hear what their favourite Blue Hills characters are up to. Listeners identify so closely with the characters that when somebody in the serial had a baby, layettes were sent from all over the land. And when a married couple were about to split up in the serial, advice was sent from amateur marriage guidance counsellors everywhere. Now, my own personal boom started about 1944. I'd been living in Brisbane for two years, broadcasting as an announcer from 4BH, and doing an early morning show with my brother, Chris Christensen. I was also doing plays for the Brisbane ABC. Charles Carson, manager of 4BH, had given me my first break in radio and always had such faith in me that he inspired me to go to the Big Smoke, Sydney, and have a crack there, which I did. I auditioned for and won the plum title role of Empress Josephine in a historical serial written by a wonderful New Zealand writer, F.W. Kenyon. It was called Josephine, Empress of Sorrows, and all day every day was spent for some weeks recording the 153 episodes under the direction of the well-known E. Mason Wood, senior producer of the Macquarie Broadcasting Network. The late John Alden played Napoleon, and John Deese of Quiz Kids fame did the narrations. When another sparkling facet of the golden days began to shine, the wonderful Colgate Palmolive unit was formed. This was the biggest thing of its kind ever in the history of Australian radio and embraced several types of family entertainment encompassing quiz shows as well as variety and musical programs. An orchestra of 60 top flight musicians were engaged under the baton of the late Dennis Collinson and my husband Dan Scully was a member of the string section. These were truly star-studded shows bringing top professional talents from everywhere. You may remember a fine singing trio, the Lester Sisters. Jack Davy, that most marvellous quiz master of the razor-sharp wit from New Zealand. Hal Lashwood, remember his... Yeah, there, Macaki, voice from Macaki Mansions. Harry Avondale, who always introduced himself. It's me, little Spencer, the garbage man. Young Harry caught this Griffith with his... Hey, Dad, where are you, Dad? And that great Australian master of comedy, Roy Reen Moe. Hundreds of others appeared over the years. Strella Wilson, Ada and Elsie, singer Peggy Brooks, Joan Wilton, opera star Betty Prentice, even such talents as the famous Australian baritone Peter Dawson, who appeared in the early days. I think a little of the famous Poi song wouldn't go amiss here to point out the quality of the artists engaged for the famous Palmolive Hour. Mara Maori made and brown fame for Poi play. Colgate's engaged me to do their commercials exclusively for ten years, and it was a most happy alliance. You may remember the voice of Colgate as I was known with the tagline, The Fragrance Men Love. Well, I was in a store one day and the assistant asked me if I ever listened to the radio, and I said, Oh yes, yeah, sometimes, and she said, You know, every time that girl comes on and says, The Fragrance Men Love, my old man says, Ah, put a sock in it. Yes, these were our salad days. The money was good and the hours short. And the Colgate shows were so professional and popular, we thought they would never end. Dan and I were happy because we were working together, and I particularly because it gave me the opportunity of knowing and working with Roy Reen, Mo. The Palmolive Hour was a live broadcast, and in the years just after the war, electrical blackouts were prevalent. I well remember one night, a male singer, Alan Code, was belting out most dramatically a song called Ghost Riders in the Sky. The orchestra was going full belt, and the fiddle section were as busy as blazes carrying the rhythm, diddlum, 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 when suddenly in the middle of the song, you guessed it, a blackout from Bunrong Power Station, and every light in the auditorium went. 
The musicians couldn't see the music, so the fiddles just kept going, diddlum, 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 with nothing else going on at all, until they put candles and lamps all round the stage, and the song then continued as though nothing had happened. Yes, live broadcasts could be quite traumatic. And another time, the orchestra had started the intro for Joan Wilton's song, and suddenly a look of sheer cold panic came onto her face. The sensitive Dennis Collinson, the conductor, immediately knew her need. She'd lost the note and couldn't pitch it to start, so he quickly left the podium, sang the note into her ears softly, and lo, she was able to start right on time. And another time, Mo Roy Reen, who never wore his teeth off stage, used to carry them to the wings in a glass of water and slip them in the moment before he was due to go on. Well, this particular night, we had a new singer, opera star Betty Prentice, making her first appearance just after Mo's spot. Well, I was standing in the wings with her when, all at once, feeling nervous, she grabbed the nearest glass of water and downed it in one gulp and then went on and sang like an angel. I broke the news to her as gently as I could that she had imbibed Moe's tooth water. The poor girl fainted dead away on the spot. No, she didn't quite, but I can assure you she never did it again. Well, more about the incredible Mo next time. Roy, of course, passed on in the late 50s, but his memory is always strong with me and very precious. I never tired of watching him work, and was always thrilled when he would include me in one of the sketches in the show, and never ceased to marvel to his incredible timing for which he was famous. He was a great genius. Personally, he was a most complex character, and like all truly great comedians, a very serious person. You know, I often think of Roy when I hear young actors playing comedy miss out on a laugh and immediately blame the audience for being dull. Roy, not so. I've seen him face an almost hostile audience, and this would rouse his Jewish resilience and artistry. He would work harder and harder with them until they were in the palm of his hand and rolling in the aisles, or till they remained not a dry seat in the house, as we say in the business. Now, Roy had a theory that if professional actors laughed at him at a rehearsal, then the script should be changed, as it wouldn't amuse the man in the street audience. I've seen him go away from a rehearsal where the cast has fallen about and come back with a completely new script. His sense of what the public wanted was infallible. He was known as a blue comic, and I must agree that he could be very rude, and his famous makeup and lecherous leer were a legend. But when it came to his private life, he was both prudish and protective. He seemed fond of me, and I felt very flattered when he would ask my opinion or tell me little things in confidence. One day he said to me, Pig, have you seen the new show at the tears? Oh, it's blue. I couldn't take Sadie and the kids. Roy had no sense of humour, and he could get quite jealous when another comic got good laughs. But he'd little reason to worry. He always held his position as Australia's great master of comedy till he died. Let's listen to a segment of Roy Reen's Macaque Mansions from the Palmolive Hour in the golden days of radio. Where are you, Dad? Here I am, Dad! <laughs> Hey, Dad, guess what's happened? What? Starting from next week, the landlord is going to raise the rent. That's very nice of him, because I'm done if I can raise it. <laughs> no, Dad. No, we've got to pay more, or we'll be evicted. Have you? In the Bacacchi family, there's no such word as eviction. We call it the moonlight flip. <laughs> Anyhow, I won't be sure to leave this neighborhood. Nothing but thieves on either side. Who's been complaining about thieves on either side? The joker next door. <laughs> anyway, I've got money. I've got on the annual holiday shortly. Where to, Dad? Well, where do I usually spend two weeks every year? Oh, yes. The inebriates home. <laughs> Harry! Coffee! Oh! <laughs> Oh, Maui. Oh, bloody. It's Audible Irving Burgess. Is the postman being yet audible? <laughs> Not yet, Maui. Well, I'm expecting a very important letter from the United States. <laughs> you see, Audible, I wrote a fan letter to Lana Turner. Oh, oh Steve, I thought you were too mean to buy a stamp. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, Audible, I like it so much, I thought it was my duty. So I use the duty stamp. <laughs> hey, uh, how did you know her address, Maui? Very simple. I wrote, Miss Lana Turner, Green Dolphin Street. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> Don't make me laugh. Yeah, but, but, but what state? Jersey. <laughs> Mr. 
Ashwood. Listen, Mashow, I've been a going to written a letter to Lana Turner. <laughs> Did you send it to America by airline? No, no. I sent it to China by carrier pigeon. <laughs> Bolton. <laughs> to hear my work was wonderful, but to see him was a miracle. I once heard him make a most appropriate speech at a very sad party. The Colgate Palmolive unit was disbanded in favour of the up-and-coming quizmaster Bob Dyer and his wife Dolly. The Dyers were tremendously popular, and it meant that the Palmolive Orchestra and all the artists had to be sacked to make way for them. At the last night party, our liaison officer gave a sad speech explaining the situation to all there, adding regretfully that the wheels of progress must turn. Mo gave the reply speech and said, Yes? The wheels of progress must turn, but this time they've turned the wrong way. Who is to say? Young Harry Griffith and I were the only members of the old unit to move over to the Dyer shows. And I must say that the years I spent working with Bob, or Pappy as everyone calls him, and the lovely Dolly, were extremely happy ones. Nice people indeed. Bye-bye for now from Margaret Christensen. <laughs> Memories of the golden days of radio, recalled by Margaret Christensen. Good day there, Margaret Christensen again. A little nonsense now and then is relished by the wisest men. The old adage proved right when a radio program called Life with Dexter was born. Bill Fennell, sometimes known as Fooey or Willie, conceived of this show as a sort of Australian Dagwood and Blondie. He had, in fact, made a pilot program about Dagwood and Blondie, but, well, it just didn't seem to sit well on the shoulders of an Australian cast. Then he had the idea of giving the characters names more acceptable to and identifiable with Australians and New Zealanders. Bill wrote an excellent pilot script, that is, a script to be made into a show for audition purposes for station managements and likely sponsors. He hand-picked a strong and experienced cast. Bill Fennell had always specialised in the little nervous, fumbling, mumbling type character, and he wrote Dexter Dutton absolutely spot on for himself. His cast of Kevin Brennan playing K.G. Wilmot, the heavy boss, Neva Carr Glynn, K.G.'s bossy and overbearing wife, myself as Jesse, his down-to-earth, wise-cracking spouse, to say nothing of the brilliant Ray Hartley as Ashley and Amber May Cecil as Compost, or Janie, these all acted as a foil for the little man character Bill specialised in. The pilot was made in a studio at Macquarie in front of a selected audience, and we were away. The audience response was tremendous, and the show sold almost immediately to a national sponsor. The first broadcast indicated that life with Dexter was a blockbuster. Macquarie switchboards were jammed, and the show was right off the ground from the very first word. Every husband in the land could see himself in the meek and mild, slightly henpecked Dexter with an overbearing boss, and every wife identified with the practical Jesse. Every boy and girl in Australia and New Zealand waited with bated breath for the dreaded Ashley and his sister Janie, or compost as Ashley called her. Yes, indeed, Life with Dexter was a program for the whole family, funny and clean. After our contract for 13 episodes had expired, the show went off the air. Again, Macquarie switchboards were jammed, this time with irate listeners clamouring for more. Almost at once we went back into production and had no trouble finding another sponsor. Again the contract ran out, and again the listeners screamed for more. It was a matter of history, radio history repeating itself, and Bill Fennell through this show became a big name. Let's live a little life with Dexter. <laughs> Isn't compost coming down at breakfast this morning? Ashley, I've told you not to use that word. Jamie's spending the weekend with Doris Manning. Oh, poor Doris. Lucky us. Uh, that'll be quite enough. Yeah, pass me the toast, please, son. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dad, did you uh, sleep well? Sleep? No, I did not. I had nightmares all night. Oh, no wonder, dear. I told you last night not to eat that third helping of pork. <laughs> Dad's nightmares had nothing to do with pork. It was a headless body. A headless... Dexter, you didn't touch the chicken in the fridge. Oh, no, Jesse. He's talking about a, a ghost story I read last night. All about an apparition with no head. 
Well, I'm afraid it sort of played on my mind. Goodness, what a vacant allotment to play on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Dad, have you ever seen a real ghost? Son, don't be silly. How could I see a real ghost when there are no such things? How do you know there aren't? Yeah, how do you know? Oh, I, I just know, that's all. I've never seen a ghost, so there are no ghosts. Oh, what a poor type of an answer. Have you ever seen an atom bomb? No. So, I suppose there are no atom bombs. There is no similarity between atom bombs and ghosts. Oh, I don't know. They can both scare the living daylights out of you. <laughs> Jesse, you can't compare the atom with a ghost. Scientists have had contact with the atom. And lots of people have had contact with a ghost. But name one. Just name one. Well, there was... Uh, there was... Uh, uh, Hamlet had contact with a ghost of his father. Hamlet didn't have contact with an omelette. Look, Hamlet was only a story. Just a story by Charles Dickens. Hamlet was a play by William Shakespeare. It was a story by... Well, Shakespeare adapted it from a story by Charles Dickens. <laughs> the whole point is there are no such things as ghosts. Oh, Dad, oh, I wouldn't be too sure of that if I were you. Huh. Everyone in Asheville knows that the old Vincent place on Fog Hill is haunted. That's right, dear. It's haunted by the two old ladies who were murdered there 30 years ago. Oh, those two old girls are now a handful of dust six feet underground. They're not haunting any old house on Fog Hill. Mm-hmm. Then why is it the house has never been sold? There's a housing shortage at the moment, Dad, or didn't you know? One thing I do know, there's a brain shortage at the moment at this table. <laughs> May we come in? Oh, come in, Clara. Good morning, Kimberly. Hi there. Are we interrupting a family argument? No, no argument, KG. Just a friendly discussion. Kimberly, you should know the Duttons never argue. Neither do we, Clara. It takes two to argue and I never get a word in. <laughs> Shut up. Remember that? Takes you back, doesn't it? Dexter ran for years, though I left in 1959 to live in London for seven years, but several actresses replaced me at various times. The voice in the segment you just heard was mine, though. I often feel that Life with Dexter would have made a jolly good popular television series. Who knows? We may yet make it for the box. And had to return to his home country where he died. I will always cherish the memories I have of the great George H. Johnston and his wife, Charmian Clift. Now, several commercial companies had taken up the cudgels on behalf of serious radio drama, and the big Sunday night hour plays came into being. The Lux Radio Theatre and the Caltech Show had fantastic ratings. These were so popular that the stations decided to have midweek hour longs also, and the Harry Dirt Playhouse and the GMH hour were born. I did such plays as Somerset Maugham's Rain, playing Sadie Thompson, and my cousin Rachel playing Rachel for GMH. The Sunday night plays were always broadcast live, which could be fairly traumatic. Anything could happen, though we were always well rehearsed. These plays were always performed before an audience in the station auditorium, and the actors always wore evening clothes. One ghastly but quite funny incident comes to mind when we did Goodbye, Mr. Chips on Caltex. The cast included the now famous Ray Barrett. You may remember him as the star of the recent top flight television series made in England called Troubleshooters. I played Mrs. Chips, and Ray Hartley, whom I've mentioned in previous programs, played the schoolboy. Ray, you will remember, as Ashley in Life with Dexter. Well, Ray Hartley was a superb emotional actor and could jerk the odd tear or two like nobody I ever worked with. The broadcast of Mr. Chips had gone marvellously, and E. Mason Wood, the producer, was looking satisfied and benevolent in the control room until Ray Hartley stepped up to the microphone to deliver the tag line. Goodbye, Mr. Chips. Summoning all his innate sincerity and stunningly controlled emotion, he said, Good night, Mr. Chips. The cast sitting behind him in a row of chairs on the stage were riveted to our seats with shock at his error. I sneaked to look into the control room and all I could see was a snowstorm of scripts being flung into the air and Woody, as we used to call the producer, jumping up and down on the spot with fury with his glasses hanging off one ear. Ray Hartley, who's quite unaware of his mistake, was back in his chair in a state of blissful euphoria until I leaned forward and caught his eye and I whispered, Good night. At first it didn't sink in, but when I repeated, Good night, to him, it dawned and poor Ray's face filled with sheer panic. Woody stormed out of the control room to announce the cast and as he passed by, Ray, he leaned down and said through his clenched teeth, I'll murder you. Ray made a fast exit home after the show, but Woody never held it against him and used him in many shows after this because Ray was such a consummate artist. 
the high standard of the Sunday night plays prompted Macquarie Broadcasting to present an annual award, known as the Macquarie Award, to the actor and actress giving the best performance in a Caltex play, an award for the best supporting role, and another for the best comedy performance. The presentation of the Macquarie Award was a very special and glamorous occasion. They ran for several years, and actresses to receive them were Thelma Scott, Lyndall Barber, Neva Carglin, Sheila Sewell, Diana Shearing, and myself. In fact, I just sneaked in because I received the very last award ever presented in 1953 for a performance in The Petrified Forest. The actor who received the male award that year was a brilliant Maori actor, since passed on, named Lloyd Burrell. And yet another New Zealander, Barry Cookson, got it for the best comedy role. The days of the mysteries, the thrillers, dramas, musical shows, and the big quiz shows with the amazing and witty Jack Davy and the incredible showman Bob Dyer, uh, with both of whom I worked closely. Jack Davy, of course, was a New Zealander and passed on some years ago. Bob, or Pappy Dyer, and his wife Dolly have retired and spend their lives shark fishing. I think they hold most of the big world records for deep sea fishing. The quiz programs in the golden days were good news and gave away thousands of pounds worth of prizes such as cars, diamond wrist watches, overseas holidays, you name it. Now, just for our last program, I'd like to ramble a bit like this with a little human interest about the stars and shows. One year, 1947, all the married radio actresses had babies, all boys. Margot Lee, Betty Sutter, Irene Harper, Sheila Sewell, and I. Even a few whom I can't remember now, long out of the business. Well, I walked into the ABC one day to do a play when I was expecting Sean, and I heard a voice behind me say, One of us must go. It was Sheila Sewell gagging. She was also expecting her boy, and we both supplied much merriment to the rest of the cast when we had a long scene to do together at the microphone. Um, another little story concerns almost a year in the industry when work for us actresses was very scarce. It was about four years after the war, and shows like Damn Busters and Reach for the Sky were very much in demand. Well, these all had male casts, and the ladies of the profession felt very rejected until a knockout show called White Coolies was produced. This was a true story of a group of Australian and New Zealand nurses who were interned as prisoners of war in the East, and all their trials and tribulations. This, of course, was almost entirely a female cast, and it was especially interesting because after we finished the very dramatic, sometimes sad serial, we met all the original nurses who had actually gone through all the ghastly experiences war had imposed upon them. We had a luncheon after the serial was completed at Usher's Hotel Sydney, all the cast and the nurses, and we were able to hear at first hand their true stories. Now, maybe you'd be interested to know what some of the top radio actors uh, are up to now. Well, I think everyone knows the Peter Finch story, along with that of Rod Taylor. Their acts of faith in taking themselves abroad have led both of them to world fame and fortune. Ray Barrett, you will know, as the lead in the British television series Troubleshooters. Bill Fennell of Life with Dexter, well, he's trying his hand at straight acting in Sydney. Max Osbaston of Dad and Dave is still performing and has also gone into the production side of television, as has the perennial Nigel Lovell. Don Crosby, son of the famous Marshall Crosby, you may remember him as Officer Crosby in the vintage radio series of that name, well, Don is one of our busiest actors in television. An actor who's really hit the jackpot in Australian television is Len Teal, star of radio Superman. He starred for years in Hector Crawford's Homicide. He left that show after many years as Mac the Detective and starred in the ABC TV's blockbuster Seven Little Australians, which was shown worldwide in colour and picked up all sorts of wonderful prizes everywhere. And John Gray is living and working here in radio and television in New Zealand. Now, actresses, well now, Little Barber still works in radio, mostly. Neva Carglin and Thelma Scott are still going in radio and television. Dinah Shearing, that multi-talented lady whom I admire immensely, is currently working at the old Tote Theatre in Sydney, married to famous Australian artist Rodney Milgate. And they have two sons. Hilda Skur, of course, has been married for many years to Ron Roberts, and they both work in radio and television. Me? Well, I love to travel and work wherever I go, 14 months in Japan about three years ago, working flat out on film dubbings, film narrations for the Japanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs, teaching and sending programs back to the ABC on various aspects of life in Japan, now living in Melbourne and keeping very busy in radio, but mostly television and uh, stage work. The advent of television in Australia saw the winding up of a rich and fruitful era, 
fewer radio serials were made, the lovely Sunday night hour plays finished, and almost overnight radio drama stopped, and the age of television crept up on us relentlessly. Tastes have become more sophisticated, or have they? You know, even though the old shows may now sound corny or perhaps styles of acting have changed, the radio dramas and serials gave thousands of people many hours of joy and entertainment and will always be remembered with affection and nostalgia. I have enjoyed being with you in these programs and I hope you've enjoyed them a little too. Till next time then, this is Margaret Christensen signing off and as Jack Davy used to say, thanks for listening. Thank you.